So welcome to lesson number 3 for module 1 and for this lesson we're going to ask the question is science, social and technology political? So for this first video we will be talking about science and technology as a social phenomenon and for the next video we'll be talking about science and technology as a political phenomenon. Of course this is not to say that science and technology as social phenomenon is not linked with it being a political phenomenon of course uh, they are integrated but in these lectures we're just going to discuss them separately and along the way we will be seeing and we'll be discussing about how these two um, notions are also interrelated with each other so let's get into this first video which is techno science is social but before we move on, let's discuss first about that term, technoscience. What does that mean? So technoscience is basically a term that has been coined by the first STS um, scholars. And technoscience basically refers to the ambiguity, the gray areas are hidden, uh, once a community of practice labels something science and technology. So basically, when a certain discipline or field of study says that this is a science or a technology, for this specific lecture, we're just going to be talking about it as a broad term called technoscience. And parallel to it, uh, the same STS scholars also coined the term technosocial, which basically highlights how technology affects social relationships and how social relationships affect technology but specifically we will be talking about this in latter parts of this course so first and foremost i'd like to argue that all of us you know being human beings in this world and everything else in this world are affected by social forces now social forces act upon us there are social facts external to us that influence our behaviors our destinies and our outcomes in life so to further elaborate this, these are some premises. First, our actions, thoughts, and decisions are functions of social influences. So to elaborate this, here are some premises. First, our thoughts, decisions, and actions are functions of social influences. So whatever we choose to do or whatever we choose to become, uh, these are all socially influenced and not merely just um, outcomes of our personal decision making or personal volitions so for instance your choice of your course or your degree program is not just something oh because i want to be into business or because i want to be an educator or because i want to be an accountant or because i want to be an engineer but that desire to be somebody is influenced by the social groups that you belong in and the social environment and the, the, the different media exposures that you may have. So um, to say that these choices of what to eat, where to be, how to be, what to be, these are all influenced by different social factors from our families, from our schools, from our peers, religion, media government uh, and other sorts of social sectors in our society and it always seems like our choices are personal because most of the social forces that work upon us and the decisions that we make are usually unseen and taken for granted especially when you're coming from a place of privilege Next, our behaviors are informed by both formal, written, and informal, unwritten norms. So informal norms are basically our way of life and the traditions that we upheld and the values that we uphold in society. Like for example, uh, being close with your family is a very Filipino informal value that we have. Um, and submiss submission. Uh, with under the elderly authority are also informal norms and probably this could also affect the way we behave and the, the careers that we choose. Formal norms on the other hand are those that are written either in terms of policy or in law that of course if you do not follow this law can get you into trouble or can get you into jail or you can have certain uh, penalties. And then also, our choices and our destinies are limited by or facilitated by social categorization such as gender, age, postal address, ethnicity, and social networks. 
So for example, in the sciences, um, uh, females cannot easily penetrate because it's just a masculine patriarchal um, institution, science and technology. We'll talk about that in a while. No? So for example, age, um, it is less likely for very young scientists to be able to talk back um, against um, more esteemed tenured scientists because again especially in the Philippines we are very much um, uh, enveloped by that informal uh, value of um, submission uh, under the elderly authority. Postal address, the where you live, where you reside, also influences the choices that you can make. Like for example, if you live in a remote place in the country, then there are many things that you may not be able to access. Just like if you would when you are living in an urban center such as Metro Manila. Ethnicity, of course, no, there are certain ways of life that are seen as marginalized in our society compared to um, certain um, ethnic practices no and of course your social networks of course if you are chummy chummy with the big people no with influential and powerful people your destinies whether that's a career in science or career elsewhere it it is facilitated especially if you know people and all these social forces as I've given examples can constrain and facilitate possibilities for any type of career, for any type of person, and for any type of scientific uh, community or scientific study. And therefore, the same social forces operate to facilitate or constrain the work of scientists. Like for example, in the Philippines, being an, a developing country, unlike uh, developed counterparts like United States or some European states. Science is not given that much attention in the Philippines. There's not many budgets that is being allotted for research in the Philippines compared to other countries that really give a lot of funding for research. And therefore, that being placed in the Philippines, being a Filipino scientist, is so much harder compared to if you were a scientist elsewhere. Because here, it doesn't feel that you are supported, especially now in this COVID-19 pandemic. But we'll talk about that in another day. But uh, yeah, so social forces, the, the age of the scientist, the gender of the scientist, the ethnicity of the scientists can all influence not only the way their they career in terms of the, they progress in terms of their career but also the way their studies and their advances will come out next their perception and encounters on social issues are products of operation of social process so again um, the way they see problems in society are also influenced by social forces. Like for example, scientists who come from um, poor neighborhoods, from oppressed sectors of society, would most likely um, go and do research projects that try to address the problems that they have encountered throughout their lives. So basically, your social experiences will also influence you as a scientist. Politics, also a social force, may influence the directions or the works of a scientist. Like for example, if you really want to make it big, you know, there are certain disciplines or certain branches of a given science that receives more funding than the other because they are led by a scientist who is... Um, who is very much favored by the government. So instead of you wanting to pursue your career somewhere else, you feel that you'll be more successful if you traverse that road where that scientist is found and you work under him or her. And that's an example of how political um, systems in a given society also influences the trajectory of the career and the advances that could be undertaken by a scientist. Also, social, political, economic, and the cultural climate where the, uh, the scientist is exposed to can be called epistemological binders. When we say epi epistemological binders, these are basically what can facilitate or constrain 
that the problems that you identify. Like for example, if you're a scientist who was born from a rich family in an urban center, it would be hard for you to imagine thinking about a research problem about the rural poor in a community somewhere in the Lumad communities in the South if you've been living here in Metro Manila for a long period of time. So your ability to be able to problematize problems outside your social environment is called your epistemological binders. Binders like your horse binders, like uh, um, there's the social forces can limit the perspectives that you have in the world. Now what you're seeing in this slide are the research agenda that uh, the National Unified Health Research Agenda of the Philippine uh, Health Research and Development Consortium of the Philippines um, has for 2017 to 2022. I was part of some of the talks in terms of creating this set of uh, areas of study. But as you can see here, another point to say that um, science community is influenced by social forces is that your studies are limited to these general themes of research when you're working in science in the areas. And second, I mean, I'll tell you a story. When I was here in the um, in the meetings regarding, you know, how do we fix this agenda? How do we make our agenda for 2017 to 2022? We were talking about parang, um, so what are the themes that we have to add? What are the themes that we don't have to add? And so for me, because I was exposed to uh, doing research among uh, people living with HIV, I said that, you know, I think HIV is an important research theme that has to be highlighted in this agenda what I said. And there were some people who were saying, probably we can put it under the infectious disease umbrella instead. And I, and I responded, but if you put that under the umbrella of infectious disease, which also includes tuberculosis, which also includes um, other forms of infections, I feel like the focus for HIV, which is also a very prevalent disease in our country, will be watered down. So I feel like it has to have its sort of own item in the list, which it has. It is under um, uh, holistic approaches to health and wellness. That's, I think that's it. No? So, but I was thinking, imagine if I wasn't there in the Manila sector of talking about research agenda, if I wasn't there and nobody was advocating for it, then it could have been put under the umbrella of infectious diseases and it could have watered down the focus. So this talks about, uh, so that is basically a demonstration of how science could be influenced by social forces. Because, you know, the science community talks about it they make decisions about what needs to be studied, what is not an important priority for study. And basically, these talks, these meetings, they be eventually uh, become like this, an agenda that guides the research all over the Philippines until 2022. So, there. We must also remember that the world of science is a social world. A social world is a group of people joined by conventions, language, practices, and technologies. And the science community has that. And it's important as, you know, uh, people taking STS is to ask, what kind of social world is the scientific community? Is the scientific community an objective, neutral group of people who is always you are taking into consideration the quality of life of the population in the advances and the research projects that they undertake? Or are they also like social and political animals that, you know, compete uh, for this infinite or finite, I would say, number of resources in order for them to be able to conduct the research that they want to do? You know, ideally, the scientific community follows a sort of scientific work ethic. And this scientific work ethic are, one, universalism. They believe in one way of getting the truth, which is the scientific method. 
they work as a community, they are skeptical about evidences that are coming up. They always attempt to, you know, add to the evidence so that they can come closer to the truth and falsify evidence that no longer hold water. And scientists now are ideally disinterested and detached in terms of what they are studying. They are considered or they are ideally neutral, objective, apolitical discoverers of knowledge. Which, of course, as we know it, based from our experience right now dealing with this COVID-19 pandemic, is not at all true. There's no such thing as a neutral, apolitical scientist. Scientists may be emotionally attached to their hypothesis, and therefore it would be hard for them to let go of their um, findings when future evidences say that their theory is wrong. They can get emotional about it. Next, some scientists keep their findings a secret, especially, again, if it does not support their original theory that is already famous. And some scientists may judge the work of their colleagues with bias instead of being objective. Ah, this scientist, I know him, he's a very good scientist, he has been here for many years, he has done so much for the society, for the community. So, where could he go wrong? You know, I just, you know, I just check all the boxes for this research publication that he submitted and I'll approve it right away. Diba? And also, they're like scientists. So, this is a young scientist. Wala pa siyang napapatunayan. So, you know, I'm going to be very skeptical about this kid or whatever. Lalo na pag Pilipino. Filipino to Filipino. Filipino to Filipino. Um, criticism is kind of really harsh, no? So, to further argue that uh, the scientific world is a social world, uh, Kuhn argues that scientists are very active in their own advocacies. And, and their own advocacies can, of course, be beneficial, but can also be an epidemiologic binder. And at the same time, if your advocacy is something that's very problematic, like for example, imagine a scientist who's an all-lives-matter advocate. So, he will redirect his studies in order to prove his point that all lives matter. So, you know, advocacies are both beneficial and harmful against the general population as well. Next, works of scientists are based on politics that exists within the community. I gave an example of that earlier. And then the credibility of the scientist is based on the prestige of the training institution that made him a scientist. So, for example, um, UP, the big four, the big four graduates, no? UP, De La Salle, Ateneo, UST, they're always revered. No, I pag graduate, I don't have to really just look at your credentials. As long as you are graduate from there, I know that you're a good student or a good graduate. But for those who were graduating in other schools, um, there's a little bit more skepticism in looking at them and looking at their work. Um, and I've experienced this because I, I wasn't a graduate of a big four until I was in PhD. So I did experience like having um, colleagues who had the similar accomplishments, but because they were graduates of these bigger schools, they were granted more opportunities than I had been. Kaya ako naglasal. <laughs> Because, uh, well, of course, Alasal is known to have a very good uh, reputation in terms of graduate schools, that specific, no? We're the best private institution for graduate school. But at the same time, being a graduate of Lasal also has its social perks uh, for scientists like myself. Siyempre, mas malala yan pag uh, pinag-usapan natin yung mga Ivy League schools elsewhere. Like, for example, Harvard, Yale, Berkeley, um with in Cambridge, no, these are really big schools and like when you graduate from there, you don't really have to prove yourself anymore. It's a given that you already have a good reputation, a good training background. Um but in uh, some training institutions that are not well known may also have trained their scientists as well or are good, no, but uh they aren't as accommodated as much as they would be if they weren't um, graduates from a, a big school. 
next, findings can also be preempted by uh, the scientists' expectations. No, although there are many ways that we could um distance ourselves from the findings that we do uh by doing mathematical equations so that you know although mathematics also has biases sometimes but there are ways and techniques that the scientists would do if he is of kind of heart um to make sure that his findings aren't um influenced by his own values and so with all of the arguments we've put in this video we can all probably agree with a certain degree of confidence that technoscience is a social phenomenon that the scientific community and each and every scientist that is found in that community in every discipline is influenced by many many social forces and in the next video we'll talk about the political forces that influence scientists and science communities in general